Okay, today I will talk about how global environmental change affects marine biodiversity. And in particular, I will focus on the effects of ocean warming and ocean acidification that they have in marine life. And also, and I will talk about different um, levels of organization from species to populations and communities. And also, one thing that I would like to, to point out is that these climatic stressors, they don't act in isolation. They combine, they combine with other multiple factors and stressors, such as um, overfishing, such as pollution, such as plastic habitat destruction. And this creates a loss of marine biodiversity and an overall loss of marine health. And first of all, I would like to present some very important coastal marine species. And these species, we call them foundation marine species because they create habitat and they create habitat for other marine species and also including fishes. These species, they are, they occur globally. And I am talking about kelps that also they are named seaweeds or macroalgae. I am talking about seagrasses that we know that they are marine plants and corals. Uh, these species, they also occur in the Mediterranean Sea. They are other um, um, taxonomic species that they are, they belong to the same group. And here I would like to point out that the Mediterranean Sea, it, it covers less than 1% of the total ocean surface, but it presents around 7 to 10% of the global marine diversity with high endemies meaning that this is a species they only occur in the Mediterranean and not anywhere else. Therefore, the Mediterranean Sea is considered a hot spot of marine biodiversity. Uh, as I mentioned before, this species, this foundation marine species, they create biodiversity, productivity, nutrient cycling, and also habitat for the other species. And they also produce multiple benefits to, to us, to our societies, such as coastal protections against storms, against tsunamis, food provisions and livelihoods to us, cultural and social value, including tourism. And some of them, they act also as a carbon sink. And I am talking about seaweeds, macroalgae, and also seagrasses. The outline of this presentation, um, I will talk about the project for oceans. Then also I will talk a little bit about marine heat waves and ocean acidification. Also, I will introduce coastal volcanic CO2 vents where I am studying ocean acidification at the level of community, at the level of species interaction, and also the, the mechanisms of potential adaptation to, to, to species to such extreme environments. And I will present two cases studies, and I will combine with ongoing and future research. And finally, I will present an example about communication using virtual reality. Okay, the, the project for Oceans MOPGA is coordinated by Sorbonne University and is based at the Laboratoire Oceanographie de Villefranche. And it combines a multidisciplinary approach and we combine coastal oceanography, community ecology, biodiversity, ecophysiology, mineralogy, and genomics. All of this, um, it is thanks to the collaboration of more than 30 scientists. And we, are, we belong to different um, institutions and seven contexts. And here I am presenting the team of Four Oceans MOPGAN. 
And also I would like to acknowledge and also to, to thank the, the incorporation of, and the welcome of my team and also the love eh, to me and also to the Forest Science Mukta project and to facilitate all the research and, and my life in, in the French. Also, um, I would like to acknowledge the work of the PhD students and, and postdocs. And I will also present some of the ongoing work um, um, under the frame of the PhD of Chloe Carbon, and also some current work um, by, by Phoebe Chan and Alice Mirasole. And also, no, I'm say, oh, I also announced no, the, 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 the new arrival of two postdocs um, in, in next year into the team. Okay, the, the objectives of four oceans, the first objective is to characterize the environmental variability in coastal zones and also in natural sea occurrence. Then also I will present the, 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 the objective concerning resilience and ecosystem, ecosystem shifts of communities to, to marine heat waves and ocean acidification. I will also later on um, present um, the objective of, of species tolerance, mainly of classifying species such as coral and macroalgae to ocean acidification and marine heat waves. And later I will very briefly present a new research uh, line that I am starting working at natural ocean-based solutions. First of all, I will not I will not have the time to go to the details, but I would like to, to mention that during the first two years, we have done um, very intense work in starting and also in maintaining um, different temporal series of environmental parameters. And the, the different um, um, environmental parameters that we are characterizing are temperature, pH, light, salinity. And this has taken us a lot, a lot of time. And for us, it's very important to have a good characterization of the, of the environmental parameters. Okay, now I will briefly present some words about ocean warming. And we know that the ocean absorbs more than 90% of the extra heat in the atmosphere. And this creates ocean warming and also marine heat waves. Marine heat waves in a qualitative way, they are described as a discrete, prolonged, anomalously warm water um, even at a particular location. And in a more statistical way of defining, marine heat waves, uh, they occur when ocean temperatures exceed more of the 90% during more than five days. And one thing that I would like to stress is that marine heat waves, they occur across all the globe, across all the ocean, and they have increased more than 50% over the past century. And eight of the 10 most extreme marine heat waves have occurred after 2010. And in the Mediterranean Sea, in 2003 and 2006, uh, they have been registered the maximum marine heat waves intensities. Um, just very briefly, I will, um, I will introduce um, <laughs> um, the Mediterranean Sea in terms of, of, of um, environment. Um, the Mediterranean Sea is a very important um, um, place at the level of economy, history, and um, social, and the environment. And one thing that uh, regarding the, the, 
the environment, what is very important and what is very remarkable is its high seasonality. And in winter time, we have sea surface temperature that range from 10 to 18 degrees. And in summertime, the temperatures range from 21 to 28 degrees. And also it's very important to, to mention the, the gradients from north to south and from west to east. And what it's important also to mention is that the Mediterranean warming trend is, <laughs> is, 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 very, is very high, yeah? almost more than twice as the global ocean warming trend. And, and, and we have, uh, and this is around 0 0.037 degree per year. And how does marine heat waves affect to, 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 to coastal uh, um, habitats? And here I am presenting um, uh, the, the coralligenous community. Uh, we can see uh, on, the, on the left, uh, Gorgonians, uh, Paramusea clavata, and also all the surrounding uh, community before and after a marine uh, heat wave. And we can see the, the dramatic impacts at the level of biodiversity, at the level also of functioning, and also at the level of the, the, the economic uh, benefits. Then, uh, also knowing that the, the recurrence of these uh, marine heat waves, and also knowing that the mass mortality of organisms they are occurring each year um, more often, and thanks to a network of more than 70 scientists that we belong from 10 different countries, we, we, we meet together and we compile um, marine heat waves and also observational data on mortalities from the last five years, from 2015 to 2019. And we collected more than 900 surveys records and and they comprise um, different taxonomic groups, such as sponges, corals, and gorgonian. And the records, they span depths from zero meters to 45. And here also, I would like to mention two very interesting um, products is the TEMETNET, that this is a, a network of temperature and also mortality observation data and the, the tracker of marine heat waves at the global scale. And we have been um, compiling data um, for marine heat waves for these last five years. And what we have seen is that uh, the years 2015, 16, and 18, they were the hottest years. And the, worst, the warmest regions are the Levantine and the Aegean Sea. And marine heat waves are becoming common, are intensifying rapidly, and they are extending over larger areas. Then, and regarding the mass of mortalities of organisms, 60% uh, of all the, the data set presented mortality. This included 50 taxa, comprising eight different taxonomic groups. They comprise different habitats and also different depths. And the most impacted depths um, are between 15 and 25 meters depth. And maybe also here I will zoom to, to, to how marine heat waves affects on corals. And this is because corals are um, a very important um, marine species. And here uh, um, I will uh, present the coral bleaching. Coral bleaching is the response um, by a coral to, to the stress. When they are stressed, they, they expel the, the, the microscopic algae that, they, that they, they have in their tissue. I, am, I will need to, to say that corals, they are built of polyps, and inside of the, the polyps, they are the, the live tissue, 
and inside of the tissue, they, they leave this microscopic algae. This microscopic algae gives um, food to the coral and also gives this, this color, in this case, this brown color. And when the coral is submitted to a stress, uh, the microalgae, they, they are expelled and the coral becomes white. And if the stress uh, lasts for long, uh, the coral, they will die uh, due to starvation. And here I am going to show you um, a, a video of the Mediterranean um, coral Cladocara caespitosa, and we will have um, some different sequences, and you will see this bleaching uh, process yeah, when, and this happened when Cladocara was submitted to, to a marine heat wave. And let me see if, if it will work. And this strategy is most of the corals in the tropics, they, they have this, um, symb this symbiotic relationship with the algae. However, in the Mediterranean Sea also, they are corals that they don't have uh, this uh, symbiosis with, with uh, microalgae, and they are called azocentellate coral. And also when they are stressed, uh, when they are stressed, they lose uh, the, the tissue and what it creates is a necrosis, a, a, a partial mortality. And here also I am going to show you a footage of the coral um, asteroides calicularis um, submitted to a, a marine heat wave. And you will see at the end the, the polyps of white color due to the loss of the tissue. Then moving to ocean acidification, we know that the ocean um, absorbs around 25% of the extra CO2 that is in the atmosphere. CO2 is an acid gas and it produces acid when dissolved in seawater. Then this means that more CO2 in the atmosphere, more CO2 is dissolved into the ocean. And this produces um, an increase of acidity. Ocean acidification is a global scale a phenomenon, is a change in the basic chemistry of the ocean with a decrease of seawater um, pH. And also, what also it produces is a decrease of the concentration of calcium carbonate. And this, is, uh, this component is very important for the formation of of shells and skeleton of calcium carbonate species. And here I am um, talking about um, coral, mollusk, and also plankton species. We all know about the kilo, and we can see uh, this tremendous increase of CO2 in the atmosphere, but maybe what we are not so, so familiar is how this increase of CO2 in the atmosphere is reflected to the ocean. And on the right, I am showing the, the, the killing curve in red, and in green is the, the, the partial pressure of CO2 in the ocean surface. And in blue, we can see this decrease of pH, yeah? this decrease of pH. And one thing that I would like to, to point is that the pH is the, it's, uh, it's, uh, the measure is uh, the logarithm scale. Of. And then this means that the smallest changes, they have a very big impact. And what about the Mediterranean Sea? Um, is the, the Mediterranean Sea also acidifying? And the, the answer is yes. And also here I would like to, to, to present uh, the, the long-term hydrological station. 
that the, the law is maintaining since the 1957. And here I am showing um, a time series of the carbonate chemistry and also the pH. And we can see the decrease of pH um, from 2007 to, um, to, to present day. And what we know is that the ocean has absorbed around one quarter of the, the, the excess of CO2 since the industrial revolution. And the pH has decreased around 0.1 unit. And this is, is, it is expected to further decrease and depending of the uh, different emission scenarios. And then the question is, how these effects affects to, to organisms. And here I am showing you a very nice example of a pteropod. Um, um, it is called a sea butterfly. And we can see the, the shell dissolution of these mollusks when exposed to pH conditions expected by, to, uh, to, by the end of the, the century. And one thing that I would like to, to, to mention is that this uh, pteropod is the basis of the food chain. And there are many fishes that they feed uh, this, this, this pteropod, no? like herring, salmon, and so on. Then and we know the, the, the effects of ocean acidification to, to to marine organisms, but also they are natural volcanic CO2 vents um, around, the, around the world. And these systems, these natural systems, they provide us a glimpse into how uh, marine life might look like in the near future. Because uh, these systems, they produce bubble of CO2 and we are talking about 95, 98% of CO2. And this produces a local acidification of the seawater that affects the surrounding ecosystems. Then here we use as an as a analog of future ocean acidification conditions. And also what I would like to mention is that this kind of um, systems, uh, they don't alter temperature. Then we are, um, uh, we are speaking about uh, the effects of ocean acidification, and they are good analogs to, to for study. These coastal CO2 vents, they occur worldwide, and they occur mainly around Japan and also in the Mediterranean Sea. And here I am presenting um, the, the the, the in situ effects of these CO2 vents on coral reefs. And we can see um, on, the, on the left a healthy coral reef. This is in Papua New Guinea, in the Pacific. And we can see a very diverse and highly structured and complex um, coral reef. And on the right, we can see the same reef at low pH size, no? and, um, at these CO2 vents. And the main responses are the clean in, in, in the classifying foundation species. The, the, this the clean in, in corals, this overall loss of biodiversity and structural complexity. And this also happens in temperate reefs. And I am showing now here Ischia. This is one of my, the study sites that we conduct our research. And on the, on the left, we can see a very diverse uh, shallow community full of mix of species, um, classifying species, and also seaweeds. And this is red sister. And the same seed in low pH, you know, where these bubbles of CO2, they occur. And I am very fortunate because um, I can do uh, this research and we can do this research in, along the Castello Aragonese. Uh, below this Castello, uh, the CO2 vents, they occur and they produce this um, ocean acidification um, effect. Just one moment and I would like to show you 
a small video. And here, for example, we can see you know, this limpet eh, made of calcium carbonate, how oh, this eh, dramatic erosion. Eh? You can see the, the white structure on the border eh, that in the meaning that it is dissolving the, the skeleton. Just to mention that the, the research at this CO2 event and, um, has been cited in in the Ocean and Cryosphere um, report by the IPCC, and also in the second world ocean assessment, in the meaning of the effects of ocean acidification to this uh, to this community, you know, knowing the response of the communities, the response of the populations, and the species in protection. Now I will present a, a case study about the resilience and ecosystem shifts to ocean acidification. And, and for this, um, we have been working in this gradient along the Castello Aragonese, and we have been working in ambient assemblage in low uh, assem in low or in low pH conditions and extreme low conditions. And the main questions that, that, that we had is how do functional and taxonomy diversity laws change in acidified conditions? And also we wanted to, to know which functional traits were the most vulnerable to ocean acidification. For this, we combine taxonomic diversity, the classical analysis of number and abundance of species, and also we combine it with functional diversity in the meaning of focusing on the, on the ecological traits of the species. And examples of, of, of functional traits, they are growth form, type of reproduction, if they are a seasonal perennial sized feeding habitats, and if they have calcareous skeleton or not. And for this, we, 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 we obtained a percentage cover of benthic species, 72. And one thing that is important is that we coded for the first time uh, and the species um, for 15 different ecological traits. And what we, um, um, what we uh, measure was or what we found it was a, a decrease of species diversity in terms of species composition, also complexity, and this we knew. But what was very remarkable was the, the decrease of the functional volume that contained all these functional entities of the species. Then also we characterized the, the, what was the most vulnerable traits along these um, acidification gradient. And what we found is that the, the forms tree-like and massive, the big forms, they were the most vulnerable. And also the species that they show with long leaf and, on, and slow growing life histories. And the, also the traits of heterotrophic feeding, eh? this mainly most of the invertebrates and calcification. Then we are expanding uh, this research to a new types of habitats that we have also discovered that also they are affected by um, ocean acidification and that they are found in these in, in new CO2 vents. And what we would like to know if, if we can see a conversion um, response uh, regardless of species composition you know, to scale up. And the new CO2 vents, they, they are located in caves, in reefs at 10 meters, and also in deeper deeps at 40 meters. Now, 
I will move to, to, to the, the species tolerance to acidification. And for this, I, um, I, uh, I would like to present two newly discovered CO2 vents. And these two CO2 vents, they, they occur naturally uh, to different populations of corals. Cladocora caspitosa and Astroides calicularis. These two species, they are the same that I presented previously during this uh, marine heat wave experiment. And then the main question that we have is that how this or how do uh, the natural populations uh, persist on this, under this extreme low pH environment? And this is really our main uh, focus. And, and here I am presenting a small video of one site. Um, it is called uh, Grotta del Mago in Italian, the Magician Cave. And, and here occurs the orange uh, coral, Astroides calicularis. The, the coral is this like flower-like orange um, um, patch. Then the the main questions that that we had is that is the first one is this and um, but just by looking the the colonies and going to the field. We, we saw remarkable difference eh, um, among the populations that they are at the CO2 vent site and compared to the populations in ambient pH sites. And what we ask is like, uh, uh, do the population at the CO2 vent site exhibit uh, different traits variation? And this, I mean, do they differ in, uh, the, in the number of polyps, the size, the growth, the mineralogy? And are these population connected or they are different? And in order to answer these questions, uh, we have combined and we have integrated different approaches and we characterize the seawater. And we also perform um, in situ population and demographic studies. We also combine um, characteristics of the, the skeleton. And also we, we also analyze uh, the population structure by using the transcriptome. And we create for the first time the transcriptome of the of asteroids. And you can find it if you like in the in the GenBank database. And here I am presenting. Um, pH data uh, at, the, at this uh, CO2 vent site at two, three, and four meter depth. It's in yellow, red, and violet, and also in one ambient site in blue. And what is in, important is that we can see you know, in ambient that the pH um, is around 8.1, that this is in ambient conditions. But we can see at this um, CO2 vent, this low pH signal, and also it's very high variability. This is very typical of this natural CO2 vent system. No? Extreme low conditions and very high fluctuation variability. And then um, what we could also uh, determine is that the the, the colonies at the CO2 vent population, they shifted to an encrusting morphology. They show it a smaller, a smaller size and they had uh, fewer polyps. However, uh, uh, the colonies, they were less porous and had denser skeletons. And this is a, or this, these results were unexpected because most of the corals, they do the opposite. And what also looking uh, 
and the, the characteristics uh, of, the, of the colonies, what we, what we realized is that, that the same calcification is invested to a minor number of polyps. And these few polyps result in having more, a more dense skeleton, meaning that the, the co 2 uh, population can tolerate uh, these uh, extreme low conditions having less porous, uh, less polyps free, but these less polyps have more robust uh, skeleton. Also, we collected samples um, for this year to be site and also on reference areas with lacking of this of the influence of, of, of the eventing. And we can see that they 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 show uh, they are very distinct populations. And this may allow uh, the, some mechanisms of local adaptation. This is uh, one research line that is still going on and we are still moving forward. Also, um, unexpectedly, um, we, we were very fortunate to, to find the larvae of this uh, coral. And the larvae is the, um, when the egg is fertilized, it transforms to a larvae then it metamorphizes the larvae mm -hmm. and creates a, a polyp. And this is the first steps of, of the arrival of, of new coral um, individuals to the population. And this is very important um, in order to, 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 to the coral populations and after, you know, to, to recover after stress and also to, 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 to move forward. And here, sorry, I'm, I'm going to present um, a, a film from the larvae uh, to, the, to the polyp. And then also these polyps that I just showed you, and uh, we are analyzing the, the, the mineralogy, the, the density of the skeleton. And for this, uh, we are looking at the, at, at the 3D uh, uh, reconstruction image, and we are analyzing yeah, the, the density. And we are analyzing the, the, the polyps that, that they are from these search events and also from ambient uh, conditions. And another step forward is that we are using um, this, the, the tissue of these polyps in order to explore gene expression and um, in, order, yeah, in order to, exp uh, to explore gene expression. And what we are interested in is to, to see if we can see difference in some particular genes. Um, and I mean for the genes that they are involved in, in, in calcium regulation and pH regulation. And finally, I will present very briefly um, the last objective. And and this is a new research uh, film that I am um, starting with the Four Oceans um, um, project. And we endeavor to, to do um, science that, that, that enhance, no? that enhance ocean nature-based solution while contributing to protect uh, marine biodiversity and nature. And here, what I would like to, to, to show you is uh, these uh, seagrasses, this uh, Posidonia oceanica. This seagrass is endemic to the Mediterranean Sea. 
and it has the capacity to, to fix uh, organic carbon through photosynthesis, but also it has the capacity to store this carbon to the, to the sediment and beneath it, and it can store it um, over uh, centuries and, and millennia. And then we have been collecting sediment cores inside of these CO2 vent systems and outside. And what we would like to know is uh, the sequestration mechanism of these seagrasses and to know the rates and to know uh, and also to date these, uh, these, these, these sediments. And by finalizing, uh, I would like to, to, to show you that um, before COVID, uh, we have done some two virtual exhibitions. And in order to communicate our research, in order to communicate the, the value of the ocean and also to communicate the, the effects of global environmental change to, to marine ecosystems, and we used two, two virtual reality films, the Crystal Reef and the, the Stanford Ocean Massification Experience. These two films, they have been produced by, by the Virtual Human Interaction Lab at the Stanford, and they are freely ab uh, available. And I need to say that the experience was great. And the students, they were very, and happy and they really they were very enthusiastic and very excited of these uh, of these products and thank you very much for listening and also i need to say happy christmas and new year okay thank you and thank I you very much Nuria. Um, i will now stop sharing Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'm sure there are questions. Uh, if you want to raise a question, please uh, raise your hand, type it in the question and answer tool, or also put it in the chat. Uh, I will then either read it out or will also can also uh, enable you to speak if you are an attendee. Okay, uh, maybe I'll have the first question. Mm. You showed in the in the pH series from from um, the natural side that actually you have a much stronger variations in the pH, and uh, you compared the means of that to the mean of the ambient side. But um, this is maybe this variation is much more important. That that for example the very extreme levels are um, the ones that. Uh, uh, are a problem for for the organisms and not the mean. Yeah. I know this. Um, maybe I I, um, I show you temporal um, variation, but also um, there are other graphics that we we see. You know this variability you know, because what's happened. When you, you are totally right. You no, know, that it's not just only the mean, and also it's the exposure time. You know, that they have been under these. Um, um, particular uh, pH conditions in this case. This was for simplistic reasons and not knowing, you know, uh, I couldn't go to, to the data, but also there are other parameters behind uh, the mean, you know, like, you know, the time of exposure and, and also extreme events inside of these uh, extreme conditions and, and so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's a but, very good point. But then how, how much do you think are the uh, like CO2 vent sites are really analogs for the future? Because I, in the future, the pH will not change dramatically. It will go down, um, but it will, will be more stable than at these sites. So. They are, yeah, this is true, but also this natural variability or what we see is that this is true that it's stable, but this natural variability also we see it in, in, in different other parameters, no? like temperature, for example, that we see, you know, this very large uh, um, temperature fluctuations in, in summertime. And this is one thing that it's, you know, that it's uh, becoming more common. 
is very high uh, oscillations. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a question from Isolde van Riemsdijk concerning the changing environment in marine systems. Is there any indication that the organisms in these systems are adapting, are adapting to new situations? For example, changes in the genes involved in shell building processes. Yeah, this this is one thing that, um, for example, eh, it's we we are studying. Eh, we are moving forward to this, and also I didn't <laughs> present, but uh, when we analyze the 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 population, the genetic structure of the population, also we saw very strong divergence on at at least. 13 different genes um, related with, with um, calcium regulation. That this is one thing that, that we are moving and there is also a lot of research that is moving in that direction. We have seen a lot of uh, responses at the level of acclimatation and now uh, the next step is moving to, to adaptation and to see which genes they are, uh, they, they they change. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a question by Shiru Kuni. You mentioned that in more acidic environment, corals tend to reduce the number of polyps and these get a mm. thicker skeleton. Did you check whether there is also change in mineral composition of their skeleton? That's a good point. Uh, we haven't done yet. Um, it's a good point. Maybe we, we, will, we will see. <laughs> And also, I need to say that the that, that corals, they have um, mostly is aragonite, hmm? um, but maybe it's a, this week we, we can see. Also, one thing that when I presented the polyp, this 3D uh, image of the polyp, uh, also the polyps that they are coming from this CO2 vent site, they present a thicker, um, 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 like structure that also, you know, corroborating a previous thinking. But okay, this is a good point. I, I might check it, but also, um, yeah, I, I might check, but most of the corals, I need to say that they, they, they have um, araponite that maybe, I don't know if maybe this one is good. Uh, have also mm -hmm. other, you know, um, um, and, and the aragonite is more, more soluble, they, right? Yeah, what's happening is that, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it's more soluble than, yeah, the, that calcite, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, maybe another question from my side to show the early studies on the um, pteropods. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, at least, so I'm also a marine biologist for the others as a information. And uh, so I also worked in a, in a lab that worked on ocean acidification. And there we also saw that much is related to food. For example, that mussels, if you starve them and then expose them to high, uh, low pH, that then they get into trouble. But if you actually feed them properly, uh, like starvation is, is happening often in, often in experiments and uh, by, by accident. But if you feed them properly, that then they have no problem with acidification. Mm -hmm. yeah. What is? And, and what do and what do you like to? Uh, I mean, what, what do you think about your, your work in that relation and how, how do you think is the food situation in this yeah. acidic environments or in, at the vent sites? I can imagine that mm -hmm. also there, if you have these bubbles and yeah. things, that, that maybe mm -hmm. that changes a lot. That yeah. is, mm -hmm. No, uh, this is true. And, and, you know, also, I would say that this is not only, you know, for, for, for CO2 vents, but also, you know, marine heat waves and so on, that it changes a lot if you have food supply, you know. And regarding your question, Raina, <laughs> you know, it's nice that you mentioned this because um, we are collaborating on nowadays at, at, at the law, but in the France, there is a, a scientist, a visiting scientist, um, Andrea Bortoli, and we are looking, you know, the, the zooplankton and composition, eh? 
We have been taking samples, from the water samples, or plankton samples, and also coral samples, and we will, you know, track um, the signal in order to see if there are differences um, from bend and no bends in um, um, by adhering um, food. Mm -hmm. But yes, uh, it's. Okay, um, maybe last question then from my side, if there are no further questions, and you also showed the, um, um, your ideas about nature-based solutions, so how do you envision uh, seagrass to, to actually, uh, I mean, how do you envision to change the seagrass system so that it takes up more C2, because um, I mean, there are seagrass beds somewhere in the Mediterranean, and uh, you would first of all need to protect them, uh, and then to to increase the CO2 uptake they can do, you need to even grow them, or and, and then maybe also change them in a, in some way so that they can take up more. Are there ideas? Yeah. Um. What you are also, let's say, it, like suggesting is, you know, like um, like. Uh, actions of, of restoration and maybe you know if you know if you see that there are some uh, meadows that they have more capacity you know to to add car co2 then to take these and you know to do active restoration this for example uh, they are doing at this moment in coral reefs no? that they are looking for super corals let's say that they are resistant to to, to heat and then, yeah, and they are trying to, to, or they are, you know, transplanting them to, to, to the field. What's happening is, is this scalable, you know, because maybe this, okay, you can do it, you know, in a, in a very limited um, area, like, you know, um, we are talking about, you know, large size. So that, I, I would say yes, no, that is, you know, the, the, the good uh, path, but maybe also, you know, more preventing and more conserving that, that, that maybe, you know, the, the, the opposite no? of restoring, that maybe, you know, uh, conservation will be the first step. And then of course, not to, to help with other um, parallel uh, actions. Mm -hmm. 